Hello and welcome to the basics and best practices of writing for chatbots. This is a webinar that I recorded with the UX Professionals Association International and the very beginning of this webinar got cut off a little bit so I just wanted to hop in here afterwards and introduce what I'm going to be talking about today. If you're not sure who I am, my name is Hillary Black and I am a conversation designer, marketer, and content creator. And today I'm going to review all of the basics of conversation design, my exact process of how I go from a blank page to a fully designed chatbot, and my top 10 best practices for user experience and for copywriting. At the very end, I'm going to answer a few questions that I got throughout the session and be sure to stick around so that you can get an exclusive discount to my online course. And with that, let's dive into the webinar with why are we here and the conversational AI industry. Writing right now, just in fact, uh, UX Magazine in December of 2019 named conversation design as the projected fastest growing role in 2020 for writers. And I would say as someone who's a conversation designer, that was absolutely true. Here we are at the end of 2020 and this role is really just continuing to grow and grow and grow. Um, the use of chatbots has definitely increased as we see um, in the wake of COVID-19. Um, chatbots are expected to grow as an industry to $9.4 billion by 2024. And that's something that has continue to grow over the course of the last few years. 50% um, of businesses are projected to spend more on conversational than on mobile in 2021. So as you know, that's huge. People are shifting their budgets from mobile, they're shifting their budgets from web into conversational. So they're you know creating a strategy, whether it's for Messenger, it's for their website, it's for an in-app chat, they're spending money on conversational AI initiatives. And that is something that is continuing to increase. We're expecting voice assistance to triple in the next three years. Um, you know, there's going to be a growth of a thousand percent of voice devices in the next year. That is absolutely insane. This is an industry that is just continuing to grow and grow and it's showing no signs of stopping. The problem is, and you might be aware of this, Many of the chatbots out there right now are bad experiences. And for years, we have seen these bad experiences. They're actually slowing the growth of this industry. And as you've probably seen, there has been many articles that have come out over the past few years of chatbots are dead. I deleted my chatbot. Why are people spending money on this? And it's really because of these bad experiences. They're giving it a bad name and they are really harming the overall growth of this industry. So why are there so many bad experiences? Why is this? Why are people creating this? Chatbots need writers. They need writers just like you. And the reason why is to create these good experiences. You want to simplify the overall experience. You want to think of the user first and you want to inform the technology engine. And this is the exact role that a writer plays within a chatbot being created. So that's what we're here to talk about today. And since, of course, I met an audience full of UX writers, I just want to point out that UX writers make great conversation designers because they understand effective user experience. And that is really the key to creating a good experience is to understand what the user actually wants. And while there is no ideal background for uh, like transitioning your skills from whatever discipline you're coming from to conversation design, UX writing fits incredibly well. And I will talk a little bit more about those specific skills and how it translates coming forward. So before I get to all of that, who am I and why am I qualified to be teaching this webinar? Um, I think a lot of you probably know me from either my Facebook group, my LinkedIn content, you might have seen me on another webinar. Um, you know, I am pretty active within the conversational design space, but before I was a conversation designer, I was a social media manager and a copywriter. And my experience in conversation design actually started about three years ago. And so by day, I am the co-founder and the head of marketing at MAV which is an automated SMS assistant for FinTech customer acquisition. 
I am also the founder of the newly created job board, conversationdesignerjobs.com. I am the creator of Conversation Designers Internet Club and also the author of Chatbot Writing and Design, which is a online course with UX Writers Collective. And that's sort of what connected me with this audience here today. And I also am a speaker, a content creator with um, Amazon Alexa and DiscoverBot and also a one-on-one -on -one conversation design coach. And so my passion really is to be in events like this. I love teaching people just like you all about conversation design, how to become a conversation designer, how to be better at being a conversation designer and how to get hired as a conversation designer. So today you're going to learn what is conversation design? What is this word I keep saying? Uh, why businesses actually need writers, conversation designers to make these effective experiences, what the beginning to end process is like, and what my top 10 best practices are for bot copy and user experience. And then I'm also going to answer all of your questions and tell you what to do next if you want to become a conversation designer. So if this sounds good, uh, please drop a thumbs up in the chat. You're all hanging with me so far. Thumbs up, thumbs up. We will be sharing the recording. Um, I do say that you should stick around because you'll be able to get your questions answered. So if you have a question, uh, please drop it there. I see we already have four questions. And so I'll make sure that I am getting to those uh, by the end. So let's get started. First, let's talk about that word that I've keep, I keep using. I've said it probably 20 times so far and what it actually means. What is conversation design? So first we're going to cover a lot of the basics. What is conversation design? What does a conversation designer do? So conversation design can be thought of as the UX writing for chatbots. Instead of writing for a user interface, whether it's an app or a website, you're going to be writing the text, buttons, and intents for a conversational interface that supports an automated experience. So this would be automated text messages, website chatbot, messenger chatbot, in-app chat, anything that is an automated conversation between a human and a bot is something that will be written by a conversation designer. And so intents, um, that's something that I'm probably going to also be using a lot. And intents are the actions or words that a user replies to a message with. And so this is like, if you think of something that the user is intending to do. So they might be answering a question in a different way because they intend to say something else. And so the bot has to understand what this person is intending to reply with or do through a word or an action. And so there are times where a bot needs to understand multiple different intents within the same question so that they know what the user is trying to communicate. And when you see something that isn't a multiple choice uh, question, this is something that is going to be this different sort of intent library that a bot has, all the information that a bot knows that is or is not communicated to the person who is using it. And so with that, the two types of main bots that a conversation designer will write for is either a rule-based bot, which is something that is sort of just a dialogue tree. So you have um, you know, a set of rules, a concrete script that a user will go into and it's predetermined path. So they can only stay on this path and they can't do anything else. And then on the other hand, we have an NLP based bot. So this is something that's using, using natural language processing and artificial intelligence and different models that are going to parse these intents that I previously mentioned and decide which answers to serve up. And so this is something that's going to be more open-ended. So um, a good example, I think, of NLP-based bots versus rule-based is if you think of using a smart speaker versus using a text-based bot. So when you're talking to a smart speaker, there's not really multiple choice. You have to say it, and it has to know what you're saying. And when you're using you know, a multiple choice Facebook Messenger bot, there's buttons, you click them, it knows what you mean. So that's basically the core difference of those two things. In my opinion, the most good experiences when it comes to chatbots are using a combination of rules, so predetermined questions and answers, and NLP intents so that it's able to actually understand it. But what makes something good or bad? And as I said before, 
I'm sure that you have experienced a lot of bad chatbots in your day. Um, just let me know in the chat if you have had more good experiences or bad experiences when it comes to bots. I see one good, bad, 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 more bad. I just avoid them. I don't think I've ever had a good bot experience. Well, I think it's my personal mission to change that so that you do have a good experience. Well, yes, these are all things that a conversation designer is here to solve. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of bad bots out there that are giving chatbots a bad name. And I think that it is very possible to change that. Because as you see, making a good chatbot is actually really easy. All you have to do is have it be easy to use, actually have value for the user and have it work. It doesn't fail all the time. It is easy, you know what you're gonna get and that's what you get. And that's a really good experience. But the problem is these bad experiences, they have no purpose, they don't work very well, they say, I don't understand you, they're trying too hard to do too much, they try to be too open-ended and they actually aren't smart enough. I know Katie, I also miss Smarter Child from the AIM days. That was my original chatbot of what got me into this space. <laughs> I've had a good experience, but it was transitioning to a live agent. So as you see, even with people who are interested in this space, we've had a lot of really bad experiences, but when I lay it out this way, it's actually pretty easy and you can see how it would actually be easy to create a good chatbot. So with that said, we know businesses want chatbots. We know why they want them. They're more efficient. They're more cost-effective. They're available 24 seven. It's a growing industry but what they need is conversation designers. They need someone to actually be writing this information. They need someone to be approaching it with a strategy. They need someone who knows how to create a good experience. And so here's why UX writers are a great match to become conversation designers. So the core skills that you need to rely on as a conversation designer are creating concise guiding language, approaching the experience user first, making sure that a user successfully completes the tasks, enhancing the experience with personality and obeying a style guide, and preventing and fixing errors. So I think it's safe to say that all of these skills are something that a UX writer has. Is that correct? Can you guys let me know in the chat? Yes, 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 yes. So yeah, as you see, they should have them. <laughs> they better have them. These are all skills that a UX writer is going to rely on in their day-to-day. -day, and these are all things that a conversation designer is going to rely on in theirs. And so you can imagine that it's actually very simple to be able to make a transition from UX writing into conversation design. And like I said before, there is no ideal background for conversation design. I personally don't have a background as a UX writer. I have a background as a copywriter and a background as a social media manager. So I understand how to write copy that you know uses a personality. I understand how to make sure that a user understands what I'm trying to say, create something that's engaging and that they want to reply to. But there are a lot of different paths that you're able to take into conversation design, whether it's journalism, whether it's writing, whether it's teaching, whether it's psychology, whether it's comedy, their film, there really, really are a numerous ways that you can get into conversation design. Um, and there is no ideal path, but I will say that I have seen in my personal experience that UX writing is a very clear path into becoming a conversation designer. So now let's get into the real thing. How exactly do you design a chatbot? So I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal design process. Um, this is going to be different depending on if you're working with a team, if you're working with a client, if you're working within a company who already has established way that they actually design. But this is for me personally, what has worked to go from a blank page to a real chatbot. There are three main phases to my design process. And I think that this is something that Every single process needs to have, no matter what it looks like, it's going to have these three phases of strategy, writing, and testing. And so you're going to first start with this strategy portion of it, where you're focusing on setting the goal, creating the personality, and mapping the flow. So this is really all of your background information that you're using to actually know what to write. And then you get into the writing aspect of it. 
And so that's where you're going to be uh, going over the key flows, you're going to be going over the secondary flows and the intents. And then thirdly, you are going to be in the testing phase. And so this is going to be editing the experience, testing it, um, um, and then continuous improvement. So this is something that you're going to be focusing on throughout the entire experience, but it's really going to come into play a lot at the end. So first I wanna cover the strategy phase. And so during my strategy portion of my design process, I'm going to be going through these steps. First, I'm going to define the purpose, which is like, what the heck are we doing? Why are we creating this chatbot in the first place? You really need to understand, you can't just have a chatbot because you want to have one. You need to have a purpose of why you're creating it. You need to have a real objective of why you're adding it into your ecosystem of online properties. And that's the same for if you're gonna have a mobile app. You want to know what's this app gonna do? Why are we gonna have it? You can't just have one because you want one. And so then you're going to define the goal. So this is going from the actual inside of it is what is the user going to accomplish by being a part of this chatbot? So when they go in, what is what are we going to say you're going to get at the end? And that could be a number of different things. Um, and then next we're going to outline the steps. And so that's where you would say, now that we know our goal, we know our finished product, what do we need to do and how are we going to go from point A to point B? Here's all the steps that we need to complete in order to get there. And that's where you can kind of see in this um, flow map that I have, the one on the left that's like quite long, that has quite a few steps that a user is going to get from the beginning to the end. And then next you're going to define your audience and your persona. So this will help to inform a lot of how you're going to write. So you're going to say, who is this for? What did they know and what did they need a little bit of help with in order to actually accomplish these goals? Do they need to be able to do an open-ended question? Do they need to be able to see only buttons? Do they need images? Like what do they want and what are they going to respond to? And then that will also uh, be a part of your persona. So what is the brand about now? Um, what is their personality already? And how are they going to actually adapt that into this sort of automated experience? So when you're not dealing with a human agent, you get to really define this in a clear way. And you get to know that it's going to be consistent every single time. And so that's part of the benefits of chatbots, but also it's something that you really need to uh, take into mind when you're actually creating your strategy. And then lastly, you're going to be mapping the flows. And so this is the outcome of the strategy phase is you're going to create flow charts, kind of like these ones that I have here on the right. So the examples that I have here are for, one is um, you know a more spelled out way. And a lot of people like to do it this way. They like to put the actual copy into the little boxes. Personally, I don't like to do this uh, because it doesn't help you a lot when you have to edit. It actually is very difficult to go through a map like this and drag all the different things. If you change an answer, if you need to add something else, it's actually pretty difficult. So what I like to do is the one that is here on the right, that's a bit more uh, wide. So this is a flow map that I created for a website bot that I want to make for myself. And so all I did was put all of my key flows. So I put, you know, I want people to learn about me, learn how they can support me, learn about my community, learn about events. And then you go from there. And so you see, it's just a very clear dialogue tree. And so the next step and the next phase is going to be the writing part of it. So as you just learned, there's a lot of things that go into before you actually start writing. So before you're writing, you're doing a lot of background work so that when you get to this part, you know really what to do. You know the steps that you're going to have to take, you know the audience, you know the persona. Yeah, so there's many, many different tools and I can cover those a little bit at the end, but so with all of this, like these are sort of the tools that I have found work the best. And so in the flow mapping, you know, there's certain ways that you can do it. There's definitely like prototyping tools that you can use to make it a little bit more clear. Um, and so actually when it comes to the writing phase, I have created my own um, script template that I use. So the spreadsheet that you see here is where I go to actually write out my entire script. So this is a way that you can write your key flows. So you write, you know, your main flow, you write your happy path, which is the good answers from beginning to end. Um, then you write your secondary flows, which is, you know, the alternative paths. 
And then you create your catch all, which is what I call the fail state. So this is what's going to happen if a user types something or does something, or if the bot doesn't know what's going on. And so you wanna make sure that you have a path for this. Um, and I know, yeah, quite a few of you use this script template in order to write because it's a very clear way to actually see um, in this sort of like sheet format of what the copy is going to be like. And so if you want to um, get your copy of this template, I put the link here. Um, I'll make sure that I provide this to everyone, but yeah, you can just go to bit.ly slash chatbot script template, and then you can actually get your template here. So this is a very good way to write um, as a designer. This isn't necessarily the best way to share it. And so the other part that I included here is um, the prototype. And so this will be a video or some sort of mock-up that you're able to share with your team. Um, this is just a fake one that I put in, but you would be able to share here like press play and you are actually able to see what this experience would look like from a bot. So this really goes into account when you're talking about editing. This will actually expose a lot of what you don't know when you're writing. Like it's very difficult to see everything in like a pretty spreadsheet and then to actually experience it within a bot. So you wanna make sure you are doing a combination of both of writing, but then also of testing um, and editing. So that is our next phase here. And then I see um, for prototyping, Miriam asked, I use um, a tool that is called BotMock for prototyping. And so that's something that you can create your flow chart in there. You can write everything in there, um, but you can also like create this little video. So there's um, a bunch of different tools. BotMock is one that I use. Bot Society is another one that you can also use. Um, Katie also just dropped the link to BotMock in the chat there. And so, as I mentioned, you're going to be creating this sort of prototype, um, this video that you can be sharing with your team, with your legal team, um, just with people who can't really understand your spreadsheet and don't need to see all of the tiny little details. Of course, there are people who are going to need to see all those tiny details, but for the most part, sending a video and saying, this is the concept, this is what this will experience will be like, is a very, very effective way to share it if you're not able to build it and then just send them the live thing. And so the next phase that I wanna talk about is the testing phase. And so, as I mentioned before, um, a lot of this is done throughout. So as you're going through, you wanna to continue to be editing. You wanna make sure that you always have a sense of how much does this make sense? Like, does the user understand this? But then you also want to be doing it at the end. So you want to be having this like QA and feedback loop with your team and then also just doing a controlled release. So releasing it to just a few people so that they are able to experience it. You can see if there's any bugs and you can kind of test it out that way. Um, but really doing that with your team, sending it to, you know, people that you know and say, hey, use this, you know, try to break this because people really are going to try to break it. And so you wanna make sure that you have a lot of testing, you do a lot of different types of testing. Um, and so a few of the types of testing that I just want to point out are the role-playing way, which is where two people sit down and you just kind of read it back and forth. So this is something that early on um, is very important because you can really hear when someone is reading something out loud, do they skip over certain words? Do they say something in a slightly different way? And so you are able to have, um, you know, this dialogue and see it play out. And the next sort of like path forward from there is a Wizard of Oz testing. So that is where a um, user will be interacting with the bot and not know that a human is behind it controlling it. And so kind of like Wizard of Oz the movie, there's actually someone behind who is controlling the wizard, um, but they are just looking at what the user is doing. So you're kind of just watching and seeing how a person is using this. Where are they going? Are they making certain mistakes that you didn't necessarily think of, especially as someone who is not familiar with the bot already? So that's a really important way to test. And then lastly, um, the usability testing. So this is something that you might know from a UX world is to, uh, what I like to do is just kind of create an overall checklist and to just say that, is this usable? To say, is this message necessary? Is this usable? How does this function from a practical level? And I think it's easy to get sort of wrapped up into like, 
is this personality great? Is this copy compelling? And you actually forget about like what this is supposed to be. You forget that this is just supposed to be something that it has utility. And so you just wanna make sure that you are actually taking that into effect and saying like, is this usable? And so that's a really important way to do things. And then, as I said, this is something that is like ongoing basically forever. So part of the benefits of um, using a chatbot is that you're able to make changes like pretty much as often as you want with not a lot of work. Like you need a conversation designer, you need a tech person. You don't need to like, you know, build and deploy an entire app every single time you do it. You kind of just make a change and like send it out. So that's something that is very, very easy. Something that you're going to do is make these improvements based on data. So you wanna look at things like how far is a person getting into this conversation? How, like, what are the top messages? What is someone dropping off at a certain point? You wanna make sure that you are seeing all of these different points and you wanna create this sort of like conversation funnel. So you wanna see someone's coming in here, they're coming out here. Are they getting all the way to the end? And if not, you need to see how you can adjust that. And if you're seeing a lot of failures, you wanna know, is it because the bot's not working or is it because the question is confusing? And so this is something that I think a lot of people get wrong. They forget that like once you release something, you need to make sure you keep an eye on it and you need to make sure that you continue to fix it because that's how you go from a bad experience, which has just been released into the world and you just hope it all works out and something that you actually can improve because you're going to see once it's live, things will get uncovered by the users that you didn't necessarily know about. And so that's something that you wanna make sure that you're always thinking about. You're always thinking about how can we make this better for the user? How can we add in more layers of understanding that we didn't even think about when we were creating this? Okay, now that I revealed my process in a very, very quick and high overview way, what are the secrets? How do you actually make a chatbot? Like it sounds very easy when you see, oh, okay, strategy, it's writing, it's testing. Seems pretty straightforward, but obviously there's a lot more that goes into it than that. So now I just wanna talk about my top 10 personal best practices. So first I wanna talk about my best practices as far as it relates to the strategy and the experience part of it. So this is like, it kind of plays into writing, but it's like very, you know, separate from that. I will just quickly go through these. So I make sure that we can get to your questions. I see we have 13 of them already. Um, so number one, you must have a goal. I talked about this before. Um, I want to talk about it. It's my number one thing. It will always be my number one thing. Number two, keep it short. Number three, don't overdo the personality. I kind of touched on this, but this is one of the biggest mistakes that I see in terms of good bots and bad bots is the focus on personality exclusively. It is not the end all be all of what a good chatbot is. Number four, show and tell. And number five, have a plan for fa failure because no bot is smart enough. It does not matter how good you think your NLP engine is, no bot is smarter. Not, we're not there yet. It's not true. <laughs> like I said, number one, my top goal, my top tip of all time is to have a goal. So a bot without a goal is just a toy. Simple as that. If you do not have a goal of what a user will accomplish in your chat bot, if you don't know what that is, this is just a toy. This is just a fun thing that you're doing. It does not have a purpose. The user is not meant to use it for a specific thing. And that's not a good experience. It's just not. So if you think about any of these good experiences that you've said that you had, it's because it had a goal for you. You went in and you said, I'm going to get a quote. I'm going to get qualified. I'm going to activate a subscription. I'm going to get a free download. I'm going to resolve a customer support issue. These are all things that you want. And if you just go into a bot, like I'm just going to use this. What's the point of that? It's not for anything. And that is not how you can succeed with chatbots. So number one forever is to have a goal. Number two is to keep it short. This kind of goes for copy, but mostly for experience is you want to make sure that a user accomplishes their goal in as few steps as possible. So you don't want to ask them 30 questions because they won't make it to the end. 
you want to make sure that they can reach that conversion metric somewhere in the line of probably 10 questions max. I would say as soon as you go past 10 questions, you're running into that territory where like, unless they really, really want this thing, you're just asking too much of the user. And so think about maybe what you could offload and ask at a different time that you don't need to ask for this specific thing. And remember, like I said, this is what the user wants. They want to answer these questions, but they aren't just here to chat. They want to get in, get out, get whatever they want. So in this example here, it's saying, you can find out if you're pre-approved. Um, it will just be a few questions, a few quick questions. Sounds great to me. Number three, don't overdo the personality. And I see uh, Maria said here, when an agency creates the bot, this is my guess. People tend to overdo the personality just because it's fun. It's fun to create a personality. When you think of a bot, you want it to be super clever. You want it to be kitschy. You want it to be body. Like, there's many, many different personality traits that you might want your bot to have. But what you need to take into account is the user doesn't really care. Like to us, to me, I hold it very closely that I can create this personality. It's great. It's, you know, it knows all the right things to say at the right time, but the user just cares that this works. They just care that they can get from the beginning to the end. They don't necessarily care that it is like the funniest and it doesn't have to be funny. So another thing to keep in mind is the context of why and where and when you're having this conversation and the sentiment of the person who are you are having it with. So in this example here on the right, this is for like a COVID-19 screening. So a person who is going through this isn't probably in a super great mood. They probably don't really want to share that much stuff. They might be feeling kind of crappy, like they might have COVID-19. And so they don't really want you to be, you know, acting with a certain bedside manner. They kind of want you to be acting like a doctor. And so kind of knowing your place, knowing this bot's place, like when I'm saying you, I mean your bot, knowing your place among what you're doing um, is very, very important when it comes to personality. And I think that people just get this wrong because they just really want to create something that is engaging and there's nothing wrong with that. But you really need to take into account that the user is just using this for utility. They want it to work. They want it to accomplish their goal. And if it sounds good, that's great. If it has a personality, it's going to make them feel better about it, but not as good as it will make them feel if it works effectively. So make sure that you always keep that in mind. The next tip is to show and tell. And so what I mean by this is leading by example. So tell a user how to reply. This especially comes into account if you are using a more open-ended uh, script or if you are using something like SMS where there's not buttons. So you need to make sure that a user knows how to reply to you, that they actually understand what they are being asked to do. And especially if it is like a more open-ended question, like here you'll see the zip code, um, you wanna make sure that they know what a zip code looks like. And while it sounds easy to us, like take into account like a loyalty number. They might not know what that number is. Um, and so just seeing it is going to be helpful for them. And then say what they're going to get by providing this information and deliver on that promise. And that's something that you want to make sure that a user understands why they're being asked certain questions, especially in something like this, where it um, is talking about health related questions. And my last tip in the strategy and experience section is to have a plan to fail. So like I said, no bot is smart enough. Even the smartest bots get stumped. Recovering is so essential. This will make or break your experience. And I guarantee that all of you who said you had a bad experience is because it just didn't understand what you were trying to do. It either didn't have a goal or it didn't understand what you were trying to do where it should have understood. So take uh, this example on the right. Do not do this. Don't just assume that a user is going to use something the way you intend it to be used. So this is um, an example of World Market sending me their automated texts. All that they had to do is tell me where the nearest store is. Um, they know my location. They know they could have asked my location. They could have just sent me a link. But instead, they just continued to say the same message over and over and over and over. Even they could have said, "Sorry, we don't do that." Um, you know, this is something that 
I want to know why my answer is not ideal. I want to know how I can talk to you and then send in a human if that's necessary. So that's something that you can, you know, use like a human handoff or hand them off to a live agent. And that's a great way to get people back on track um, if they are not able to through your conversation. But there's a lot of different ways that you can actually do that as the designer. You can provide that context of, hey, I was looking for a zip code and you sent me a five digit number. A zip code has six digits. What's your zip code? Um, you know, please reply with a valid email address. All those sorts of things that like you probably think of as a UX writer. Um, these are things that we need to make sure that we're providing these examples so that we're able to keep them on track. But if they go off, tell them how to get back on. And then here are my last uh, best practices for writing. So these are my top five best practices for writing. So number one, keep it simple. Number two, use media to explain hard things. Number three, follow up, keep following up and don't forget to follow up. Number four, don't be too open. It's a recipe for failure. And number five, don't leave them hanging. Think like a human, act like a bot. So number one, keep it simple. State the question as easily, easily and plainly as possible. Don't make them guess, you know, tell them, even if it is this open-ended NLP engine, make sure that you are providing them with answers and then they can choose to reply with something else um, or just let them know exactly what to do. So in the, in, in the example on the right, you see reply with the industry restaurant. This is something where I couldn't offer 30 different options for industries. There's an infinity amount of business industries, but I can see that a person is saying something. And so I can listen for maybe I put in 30 industries into my NLP engine or the name of my business. That's something that I can't predict. I can't offer a multiple choice uh, question for that, but I can actually take in what they said. And PS, in terms of keeping it simple, don't be too chatty. Don't just have conversation for conversation's sake. Keep things streamlined, simple, easy for the user. Number two, use media to explain hard things. So media is something that you want to utilize no matter what. You want to utilize photos, emojis, GIFs, links, videos, all of that. But if a user might not be understanding something, like say you want them to send a picture of their receipt, they might not know what kind of picture you want. So if you were to just provide a picture of what you're expecting with like these numbers circled, that would be a great way for a user to know exactly what to do. And this is something that you can do with a chatbot. You can send down that GIF. You could send them a PDF of something if they have a certain question. You could send a link. You can send many different ways to explain something to them instead of just expecting that they're going to understand it and that they are actually going to know how to reply. So, and then when it makes sense, you can sort of use these to also break up the conversation. So you can use emojis if it's appropriate for your brand. Um, you can also use images. You can use all sorts of different branded things to make this really come to life. The next tip is to keep following up. And so this is something that is a huge benefit for Messenger and SMS. And it is something that I actually don't see a lot of bots doing. And this is something that a conversation designer and a UX writer is great at. Essentially, a follow-up message is a push notification. And so you are able to write a message and send it to the user and get them to come back to the conversation. Because a lot of times, like, life just gets in the way. People just don't have time to be texting you and texting your brand, or they might forget, or they might get a phone call. You know, there's plenty of things that might come up. They might need more time to get more information. And so we actually have seen, and I've seen people come back months later into a conversation. I've seen someone have a conversation over the course of like three months before they finish it. And that's something that is like very, very common. And so with Messenger and SMS, you can actually keep this conversation open because you have the conversation has started with them. It's a channel where it's like persistently open. So unlike a website where a user goes away and you can never talk to them again, Messenger and SMS creates this conversation with a user that you are able to re-engage. So a sequence that I use and I recommend is um, within three hours, 24 hours, and three days. And so I'll send three messages 
all different that will be specific to this context. And then additionally, if something changes later down the line where someone had dropped off and then we say, hey, I have another product offering that I think would be great for you. Hey, you might qualify for this. Do you want to jump back in? Um, that's something that you will see people come back. It happens like every single time you will see people come back. And so this is something to not forget about. Like, don't forget that you can actually re-engage these people on these two platforms. The next one is don't be too open. So even if you are using an NLP engine, make sure that a person knows how to reply. Make sure that a person knows what's going to happen next. And make sure that you are not just saying an open-ended question for like, just so that you can flex your NLP engine. You wanna make sure that they know that they're asking for your full name. You're asking for a date and this is the format that I want it in. You're asking for something a very obvious way so that they know how to reply. And lastly, uh, don't leave them hanging. So humans use a lot of filler language I've noticed. And they will ask, or they'll often say just like casually a rhetorical question. So I might say, that makes a lot of sense, right? And I'm not expecting you to reply to me. I'm not expecting you to say anything to me. It's kind of just a casual uh, word that I'm using. And so make sure you don't do this in your bot. Um, this is something where while you are trying to be human-like in conversation, you are a bot. And so you wanna make sure that you are using bot language, um, not necessarily like, you know, sounding like a machine, but you want to make sure that you are talking in a final statement and that the bot always has a last word. So even when you're saying goodbye, you're saying, you know, have a great day, call us now, learn about us, restart. You're making sure that they don't think there's something left for them to do. So now that you know my process and you know all of my secrets, what do you do next? How do you get started if you want to become a conversation designer? So how do you turn your skills and interests, and I hope now you are very interested in pursuing this, into a career? So here are a few very simple ways that you can start learning. Um, I know quite a few of you who are here today are in my Facebook group already, um, but that is a great place to meet other conversation designers. It's a great place to check out lots of resources. Um, I dropped two books here that I recommend a lot, but I have an, a huge resource guide within my Facebook group that you are able to access. Um, and so that is called Conversation Designers Internet Club. Um, and then, like I said, if you, maybe you're not a Facebook person, but read these books, Designing Bots and Designing Voice User Interfaces. They both are the um, O'Reilly books and they were written by professional conversation designers, Kathy Pearl and um, I forget who wrote the other one, but these books are very, very straightforward. They will teach you a lot of things that I did not cover here. Um, and then lastly is just kind of like get started, toy around, experiment, use a bunch of bots. Um, and then I also mentioned three tools here that you can use to just kind of start creating bots on your own. So you could use bot mock to create like a prototype and kind of just like a working bot, but within um, a prototyping way where you don't have to code. Voice flow is the same thing, but for voice skills. And so if you want to design an Alexa skill, that's a really good way to actually design it, prototype it, and then you can actually deploy it from their site. Um, and also chat fuel, which is how you can build messenger bots. And then lastly, of course, I have an online course where I will go way more in depth of my conversation design principles, my process, um, learn how to write for critical scenarios, learn how to develop a persona that actually works, um, create a strategy in your own prototype. And so this course is with UX Writers Collective. It's called Chatbot Writing and Design. And if you are interested, as a thank you for being here today, I wanted to give all of you a 20% off code for my course. So that code is friendschat20. So you can go to UX Writers Collective, use the code friendschat20 and get 20% off of my course. And so, like I said, you will learn the in-depth process. You'll learn all the fundamentals. There will be way more than I talked about here. I didn't even scratch the surface of what you will learn there. And then learning how to write for these key flows. And I also will be soon to be launching one-on-one um, -on -one office hours. So you will be able to get all of your questions answered by me and get guidance from me. And that is exclusive to the course. I don't offer this. Otherwise, you will be able to get some one-on-one -on -one time with me totally for free if you are part of the course.
So to quickly recap, and then I will get to your questions. Um, if you take anything away from this webinar, please remember that writers play the most critical role in making a chatbot successful. Conversation designers are a must have for chatbots. UX writers make excellent conversation designers because they understand what the user actually wants. Design should always have three phases, strategy, writing, and testing. And then overall, keep it simple, keep it valuable, and keep it conversational. So let's get to your questions. So Anonymous asked, um, for this conversation, are we using conversational AI equals chatbots? So I think that means um, I was talking a lot about specifically conversation design, and that was applying to chatbots. So that's applying to webs, anything text-based, web, messenger, SMS, um, app, WhatsApp, all of that. So that is, and conversational AI is really another way to talk about conversation design. So that is talking about anything conversational as it relates to an automated smart conversation. So there are a lot of chatbots that actually don't use AI. They just are using rules and that's totally fine too. You can absolutely do that too. Um, but conversational AI is mostly meaning uh, things that are utilizing artificial intelligence to help power their chatbot. What is the typical salary for a conversation designer? Um, so this is something that there actually is not a ton of information about, and I hope that some comes out soon. Because I do think it, of course, varies a lot based on your experience level. But from what I'm seeing, it's anything from about like 60K uh, US starting for a beginner all the way up to like 150 for experienced team leader sort of conversation designers. So that could be anything. Um, it's a lot going to depend on what else you're doing. It's going to depend on what type of company you're working at. If you're working at a startup, if you're working at an agency, if you're doing something else as a part of your role, um, that really could vary a lot. Uh, Sasha asked if we can get a copy of the presentation. Yes, I will be uploading um, the slides to this to my website, which is hillary.black. Um, I also will, I'm going to be posting this uh, video to my YouTube channel and I will share that um, through LinkedIn and through Facebook and I will link the slides there. So there will be a way to get the slides. It might be a little bit difficult to find, but it will be, um, you'll be able to see that there. Um, and same goes for if you are trying to find me, just type in www.hillary.black and you will get links to pretty much every single thing I ever have done. Okay. Kanika said, though conversational UX is a newer field, people are not comfortable with talking to a bot. I work with as a voice designer. People do not really respond well because they think a bot won't be able to help them out. They feel confused about how to talk to it, how to gain trust of users and educate them on the capabilities. So in order to educate a user on the value of using your bot, you need to show them that. You need to show them very quickly because I think from, it sounds like what you're saying, what you're designing on has multiple purposes and it actually is able to um, do a lot more for a user than what they might think. And so what you want to make sure is that from the very beginning, you are actually giving them that value. So if you can give them something easily right away that shows them this actually will understand what you're saying and what you're trying to do, that will be a really, really good way to gain their trust. And then once you have their trust, you wanna make sure that you don't lose it by just creating you know, bad experiences. You wanna make sure that you're actually delivering on what you say that you can do, because I think that's where this trust has kind of been broken. And so really the way as an industry that we can get around that is by creating better bots. Uh, Matthew asked my favorite tools for creating my flow diagram. So for my flow charts, I use either a site called draw.io or I also use Lucidchart, which a lot of you might be familiar with. Um, and I think you can also use Figma as well. You can pretty much use anything that you want in order to make a flow chart. A lot of these prototyping tools like Botmock, um, they actually have flow builders or dialogue trees within them. And so you could uh, do it there as well. Do the engine, AI engines generate the responses on their own? How do you know what you will personally write copy for? So this is actually a really great question. And I'm sorry I didn't cover this earlier because the AI does not generate what the bot says. A person, like it may, if you are using someone else's engine that was created, um, you can actually take 
all of the information that their bots know and apply it onto your bot. But someone wrote that. Someone wrote the reply that the bot is going to say. So you can train a bot to understand every single word that you want. So say you wanted to um, train it to understand what the weather is. So a person could say, what's the weather? They could say weather near me. They could say weather today. And so you're training your bot to understand that the person is meaning weather, but what you actually say back is something that a conversation designer writes. So you may or may not be responsible for that specific reply, depending on if the AI engine was created by your team or if it was created by someone else, or if you downloaded it, you got it from somewhere else. Um, so this is something that you can think about. So one example of something that I did is, um, talking about like, I'm driving. So we decided that people are saying a lot of times, like, don't text me, I'm driving. And so we certainly don't wanna be texting them when they're driving. And so while we can train our bot to understand driving, all different types of ways of saying driving, what we actually do from there is something that I had to write, something that I had to determine. So not only did I say, this is how we wanna reply, we also said, let's also not text them for three hours. And so, we wanna make sure that the action and the copy is all taken care of. Assuming you are doing a combination of rule and NLP, how can you assess what the NLP based systems are capable of? That will affect how much you can leave in the engine. So this is sort of something that you have to test. And so you have to train your NLP engine. You, maybe not you personally, but like you and your team, you have to train that to understand how much it it understands. And so it's not something that you can just like apply and then forget about. And I think that's like a bit, very big misconception thing. And that's really not true at all. You tell it what it knows and then you help it understand more. And so what you want to do is train it a lot, test it a lot and have people test it. And then anytime you're getting these failures that maybe it didn't understand something, you're adding that into the engine's um, like brain. And so you are actually the people who are determining what it knows and what it doesn't know. And so don't assume that it knows more than you know that it knows. I hope that makes sense. Yes, we did do continuous testing. I know, I'm sorry, we're a little bit over. We have so many questions. <laughs> Fine. I was just going to say, like, you're fine. Um, continue to. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah. So continuous um, along strategy and along writing. So I always do testing all throughout. I continue to edit. I continue to test. The only thing is, as you're writing, um, you don't necessarily have like a live bot. And so a lot of times if you're working with a technology team, they are going to build it for you when it is done. And so when it's done, then you can continue to edit it, but they aren't going to let you test it as many times as you want throughout. You might have that. You might have like an awesome tech team who is able to build and deploy it very easily so that you can test it all throughout. But a lot of times um, it's a very big lift for them to continue to push and push and push that all the time. So it's something that that's why prototyping helps is because you can go in and say one flow and you can like test it out. And then you can personally be the person who's editing that as it's going. What is the difference in content in the map in step one versus the key flows? So key flows, I that's just kind of a term that I was using for all of the main like happy paths. So going in and saying hello all the way to goodbye and completing it without veering off the path at all. Um, and then the step one would kind of be saying hello. So that's like getting the user into the bot. So understanding like this is the entry point, this is where they're coming in. And I think that's what your question was. Um, how closely do you work with a UX researcher? So I personally don't have a UX researcher on my team. And so that's not some, someone that I work with. Um, I'm kind of doing all everything on my own, but I assume that within, if there is a UX team, on the, like where you are working, you would work very closely with them because you would you know be understanding everything that is needed and understanding all the information that you already have. How do you reframe the goal for the users if the goal leaders give you is we don't want people to call? So if you don't want people to call, why are they calling in the first place? Like, what are they calling for? Um, that is your goal.
So if a user is calling you to get an answer to a question, then that needs to be in your bot. Your, your goal is self-serve issue resolution. That's your goal. Um, and you need to make sure that you are taking into account all of the reasons why they are calling and you are providing that in your bot. Should I begin with creating persona first? If not, why? Um, yeah, you can begin with creating the persona first. Um, I do think that a lot of brands already have an existing persona and then you need to take into account how to adapt that into your bot. To me, the persona is not as important as the purpose and goal of the bot. And so that's not my very first step. My very first step is to figure out what the heck I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And then I can figure out what it's going to sound like. So it's really kind of up to you what you want your process to be. In an interview, I was told giving suggestions to a user makes it look robotic. Do you agree? Um, I mean, sure, when you're messaging with a human, they might not be giving you these options, but also a human is a human and a bot is bot. And I think that it's fine to give the options. And I think that if you want it to succeed, you should give the options if you are unable to understand every single option that exists. One thing I notice is that you encourage show and tell by telling the user how to respond. That seems kind of contradictory to keeping it short. So um, I think that that's just going to depend on what platform you're on. So if you are on Messenger, if you're on website, you can have buttons and you don't need to say reply using the buttons below because there are buttons right there. If the examples that I gave were mostly SMS because that's mostly what I designed for. And so um, that is something that you want to take into account the overall message. So you don't need to say like, please reply with blah, 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 like you can say reply with. So you can kind of shorten that as much as you possibly can. And of course there's going to be um, bounds to every single thing that you do. There's going to be times where you maybe later on in the conversation, you don't tell them to uh, give them directions as much because you already have given them to that. But in the beginning, you really need to establish these guardrails of what and how to do things. A few questions about good examples of chatbots. Um, so there's qu quite a few different ones. I mean, they're all for different sort of purposes. And a lot of times I defer to like banking and sort of like all different customer service. So like Delta and American Express have pretty good ones. I know that Bank of America, Ally Bank, USAA, Chase, they all have spent a lot of time developing their chatbots and developing their AI engines. Um, there's quite a few different ones. An example I gave a lot throughout this was Kayak because that is one that both uses a combination of NLP and of options to reply to someone. So I would check out Kayak on Messenger. Um, and that's just a few examples. I think Sephora is another strong one. There's quite a few different ones that you could look at. Why do you use A3SMB for now and simply type to reduce errors? Um, so, and actually this question was asked quite a few times. So as I mentioned, my examples were from SMS. And so in SMS, there are not buttons. And in order to get a user to respond, we understand yes and no when they reply. But the reason why we use A, B, C, D is because those are the same letters that we use for every question. So they always are replying with A, B, C, D, as opposed to some questions are replying Y, some questions are replying A, it gets confusing for the user. And so I just wanna use the same thing consistently, but if they were to type Y or if they were to type yes, it would still be understood. And so that's kind of a strategy that you could use for that. Um, we have a fairly open bot. Employees can approach us with questions and do HR. We've been finding that a lot of users break their questions or responses into multiple inputs. Um, I actually am not really sure how to resolve this. Um, I think that maybe if it is too open, they don't understand that they actually should be sending everything all at once. And so perhaps you should let them know that please type your questions one at a time um, or please type your entire question in the message. So if it is open, it's perhaps too open. And so maybe they need a little bit more directions in order to um, prevent those errors. Any special advice for being inclusive to users with disabilities? Um, so I actually have seen a lot of people say that you should not use emojis and you should not use images to replace words and replace phrases. 
Um, and you wanna make sure that you can be inclusive by not using things like slang, by not using things that are not going to be understood by users with disabilities. That's just like a few small things that you could do, but I'm sure there are a lot of resources online specific to um, users with disabilities and then also uh, for multilingual bots, which is another thing that I saw. I personally don't have experience with localization for multi-language uh, bots, but I know there are a lot of resources online about that. So you could definitely look that up. Would it be wise to use pop culture references in the script, assuming that it not all would get the reference? Um, that's definitely, you're right on that. Like knowing your audience is something that's really important. So if you are writing for a pop culture centered brand, it might make more sense. Um, it might make more sense to use that casual language or use these references, but also understand that what happens if a person doesn't get it and is that okay? Um, that's something really to keep in mind. Someone asked, what are my favorite videos or books that teach the practical process of creating a skill? I would definitely look up VoiceFlow. They have a lot of resources that can help you with that. Um, they are the experts in being able to create a voice skill in like a practical way on your own without knowing how to code. And so that's a place that you really could be able to get a lot of resources and then you will not have to learn Python, which is the other part of your question. All right, I'm gonna answer three more questions and then I will let you all go for today because we have so many. Looking at conversation design type jobs, I see a lot requiring development experience. Is that normal or is it a business not understanding that they need both? I do think that, I think that might depend on what companies you're looking at. And so I think a lot of times that companies might be um, thinking that they need someone who understands everything because they don't have the ability to hire for both. And they, you're right, they might not understand that they need a writer and a developer, but they also might not have the ability to hire for both. And so it is um, something that I think it's a benefit for people who do know how to code, but it is not a necessity. And a lot of um, companies are wanting people who have a writing background, who have a UX background, because they have a separate technology team that is building those. Um, you mentioned one should keep it to 10 questions max, but is there a guideline for the number of responses required from the user? There is not a guideline. Um, it's something that 10 is kind of just like my personal number. And so it's something that you kind of will have to see based on data. But I would say that the shorter you can keep it to is possible. But that's a, a place where I would recommend doing that controlled release so that you are able to just put a few people through without totally blowing it up and maybe do some A-B testing of saying, some people are getting it with 30 questions. Some people are getting it with 10 questions. Where are we seeing better results? But also look at your overall strategy of why you're asking so many questions and so many having them respond so many times. Because the longer you go, the more fatigue users are going to get by using it. It's the same with like an online application. The longer you go, the harder it is for someone to complete it. Especially like in a chat bot, they can't really save their progress for later. Um, and then again, if you do see them drop off, that's a good opportunity to use those uh, re-engagements. If I can answer one more question. Do I recommend using buttons or more text-based dialogues? Any experience with the two approaches? I don't want to limit the user possibilities too much with buttons, but I also don't want only using text to be a reason for failure. So you can have both. So you can provide buttons, but allow the user to type. You don't have to remove their ability to type. Um, and so it's kind of like the buttons then become suggestions. So you could allow them to uh, use the buttons or reply with if your answer is not listed. Um, that's one option that you could do if you don't want to use buttons or if it's something where you have too many options uh, that doesn't that you aren't able to provide buttons for every single one because I think buttons are limited to like five or six total. Okay, I think that's all the questions that I have time for today. But like I said, if you have more questions, feel free to message me on LinkedIn, look up Hillary Black and you will find me. Um, and I can answer more of your questions there. We can potentially do another Q&A in the future and then we can chat more about conversation design.